Maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And we're coming to you live once again from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I'm live with you today. The talk show, Hell Hates. You know, and because hell is a place without any order. According to Job 10... The the sh- the land of the shadow of death. Let me see if I can pull that up and read it to you. It's an interesting uh, when you think about the word chaos. Chaos means no order. It's out of control. There's nothing nothing lined up. In other words, and uh, in the book of Job, uh, chapter ten, verse. 21, he says, before I go whence, I shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death, a land of darkness as darkness itself and the shadow of death without any order where the light is as darkness. That's a weird place that to me, that's like the quantum world. But anyway, so any place and I'm going to I'm going to go back and and speak again on what I was speaking on uh Tuesday about government and the need for government um and how God ordains every government that there is God put it there. For one reason or another, God did it. Now, if your view of God doesn't include the idea that God is sovereign, meaning that God is in control of everything, then I feel bad for you because you have a very wrong view of God. Um, I'm going to, uh, out of fairness, I'm going to read some of the comments that were left on um, the broadcast that I made Tuesday. And I, I posted it on YouTube, God's Rolling in Human Government. And um, I'll just kind of go through some. Uh, some of them were very; uh, they were good comments. And and mind you, I don't always go back and read the comments on my videos. Um, number one, normally when I'm done with something, I'm done with it. I move on to the next thing that I'm going to be doing. Um, Number two, I don't normally debate people. There are exceptions. And I'll give you an example. When I came back from um, Minnesota, um, I made a short little video telling everybody, hey, I'm back. Uh, we're going to gonna get back on the ground again. We're going to get moving. Uh, and I announced that we were going to have a church service Sunday, but we weren't going to, we were going to close it to the public. And um, there was somebody who, who blasted me because of that. And it's somebody that they hide behind a mask. In other words, they don't put their real name on their identification there on, 
YouTube. They don't have their real name there. So you don't know who they are, where they live, or anything about them. They're just a nameless entity. And they were blasting me with, they were using scriptures as, uh, as like a whipping post for me. Bashing me because we didn't have, we didn't let people come in the building Sunday. And I explained it. We have a presumptive positive case of coronavirus. So it's best that we just, it's my job to protect the flock. And that's what I did. So this person just kind of unloaded on me, and I said to him, and I commented back, hey, unidentified, nameless person who thinks you're holier than everybody else. Yeah, I said it. Um, instead of wasting all of your time bashing me and watching what I've got to say, and since you're, and since you're not afraid... You're, bas you're bashing me because you think I'm full of fear over this virus. Then why don't you go to the hospitals where all these people have the virus without a glove and mask and go read scriptures to them? And while you're at it, then come back and then put down your name, address, and telephone number so that people can contact you and talk to you because that's what I've done. I don't hide behind a mask. And if you want to contact me, call the call the church. Call here. Show up. So anyway, every now and then I I just sometimes I just can't let things go. But I'm going to read some of the comments from the program on Tuesday. Um, and not, I'm not going to read people's names. Um, one person commented, um, prepare, prepare and pray every day. Lord Jesus, help us. That was a good one. Bang on again, pastor. You've aced that episode. Uh, strangely enough, another person says that's exactly what's happening in New York City at the moment. Not sure exactly what that's referring to, but, um, Somebody said, choose this day whom you will serve. And Mike is right. Anyone asking for money right now should be avoided. Um, some person commented about, I think it was one minute, 49, one hour, 49 minutes into the broadcast. It was 54 years after prayer was taken out of the schools in 1963, Supreme Court, separation of church and state. That Trump slash Pence won three years later. It was 54 years after the Crowley drug culture in 1966 locked down to possibly protect children from gender confusion. 54 years, 54 bones when two, cl two hands clap. Uh, then they commented, uh, remember Rahab. If, if he, meaning God, could use her. And I agree with that. And I'm going to read... Uh, today, I'm going to give you scripture of men in the Bible that God used that did some pretty rotten things in their life, like me. Um, they also say, also, I don't worship Trump, but God is using him. Um, Truman was another one. He ended World War II, not FDR. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I would agree with that. Now, um, let me see here. Let me do that. Um, here's another one. The greatest obstacle to the truth is the belief you already have it, meaning the truth. All false prophets say they're just saying what the Bible says. It comes down to your indoctrinated beliefs you grew up with and your preconceived notions on how you believe what that's what the Bible says, no different than any other on YouTube. Now, that I would disagree with. I have, over the course of years, changed my, uh, my opinions my beliefs on what the scripture is saying. 
And I've been very vocal about that. Uh, just because I grew up one way, does that does not mean that I'm jammed into that preconceived mindset for the rest of my life. I do not agree with the statement that once you believe something, you never unbelieve it and you never change your views. Any honest person who decides that they're going to search the scripture to see whether what somebody said is going to be true or not, um, upon examining the scriptures, they often find out that they were wrong and they would say, you know, I was wrong about this. Now, I would, and I said this about Tuesday's broadcast. If you find anything that I said that was that you know for a fact is wrong, and it's wrong biblically, then give me the scriptures why you believe I was wrong, why you believe you're right. Give me the scriptures that say it. Your opinions are just like my opinions. Everybody's got one. Everybody's opinions to them is right, and everybody else's opinions are wrong to them. Give me scripture that I can read. Uh, one guy says, as usual, you're spot on according to scriptures. I thank you for speaking on this subject. I appreciate that. Uh, government, another person, government is mentioned four times in the Bible. Um, Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Uh, Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, here's what I'm going to say. Concerning that, there is coming a time when there will be perfect government on this earth. But it will be run by the perfect governor, Jesus Christ. There, As of right now, there are no such things as perfect governors. None. They all make mistakes. They all do things that are wrong. Sometimes they'll do it because of the political climate. Sometimes they'll do it because they were misinformed. Sometimes they'll do it simply because they wanted to do it. Nobody, nobody is perfect. And I have found that those who are the most critical of any kind of govern governor they themselves are probably the least qualified in the world to govern people. I absolutely wouldn't want some people governing me. No way, no how. Um, so that was, that was a good comment. I had several replies. Um... Romans 13 talks about the powers that be. They are ordained of God. Verses 3 through 7 talk about the role government plays. The government has the power to do what is listed here and no more. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Um, let's see here. Yes, it is possible to do evil after having done good as it is as it is to have done good and thereafter have done evil, each and every one of us is living proof. One wrote, were you not struck by lightning? The devil appeared the same way. No, I was never struck by lightning. Never. I, and I have no idea what... Uh, the same person said, Hoggard, you were struck by lightning. Is that now how the appeared on earth? And then they wrote, I see they have you by, and that is just, that's just crazy. And it's vulgar. I won't read the rest of the comment. But the implication is somebody is controlling me, telling me what to say. Prove it. Prove it. If you make an accusation, according to the scripture, you're to bring two witnesses. 
So bring the witnesses and prove that I am being controlled by some entity, some organization. I'm being paid off. If you make the accusation, prove the accusation. And no, I was not struck by lightning. I was electrocuted. That's different, but not struck. And so what does that even mean? What, what is the implication anyway? That if I was struck by lightning, I must be an agent now for Satan? Is that what that means? Um... Somebody writes, uh, guilt, law guilty, I don't call it my own research unless I know the person doesn't want to hear Pastor Mike. Um, I like this one. Thanks, Mike. They can shut down every so-called church building in North America, and it will do nothing to diminish the glory of the true, true church, the body of Jesus Christ. I, I like that comment. Um. Second Peter, this person quotes Second Peter 3, 8, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then they have a follow-up by saying, Pastor Mike, love you to bits, but that was half a verse you quoted. The first part of the verse tells you exactly to whom he's speaking. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word not this is this not willing that any should perish is to the us word not the entire population of the planet that i disagree with and i disagree with it because god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to say that christ only died for those he was going to redeem to say that God only wants the righteous to be saved is not in accordance with Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved, he gave it to the entire world. In uh, Ezekiel 33, um, let me see here, let me pull that up. Ezekiel 33, when it comes to the watchman. Let me see here. Ezekiel 33. Um, God says, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, this is verse 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So clearly, God... God's nature, his desire, is that he loves his creation and he sent his only begotten son for the benefit of the entire world. God is not willing that any should perish. But obviously some are going to perish. Obviously some of those in the world are not going to accept God's gift. So, and, and I appreciate the way you put it, but I I still disagree with you on that. Um, awesome video is really interesting. Let's see here. Somebody wrote, it must be the New Orleans Saints. I don't know. Who else could it be? Man's government comes as a curse that man cannot follow God's laws. So, of course, we are not exempt of man's laws except when they contradict God's laws. Now, that that's what I said Tuesday. I agree with that. Um, somebody said, amen. Yes, we have to obey the laws of the land. So tired of all these people that say, oh, I'm so offended by what people say if they don't agree with me. I try not to be uh, of the world, but I have to live in the world, so that means obeying the laws, but I, but I don't, um, by God's words, have to worship any of the land's idols. I agree with that. Uh, somebody said, and the same person who said I was struck by lightning said, boy, the money must be coming in. Never heard so much fervor from you. What money? 
What money are you referring to? What, what payoff do you think I'm getting? If you've got an accusation, prove it. Um, and let's see here. Well, and here's what somebody wrote. Several states' governors have effectively impeded free interstate travel. Now, unless, unless you know something that I don't, I strongly disagree with that statement. I traveled from Minnesota to Iowa to Missouri last Thursday. There was no state patrol. There were no tanks. There was no National Guardsmen blocking off the highways. Nobody. And I appreciate, and I'm, I'm going to make some statements now today about the current president of the United States. And I want you to notice that he has resisted. And maybe he's been advised to do this, but he has resisted putting a national ban on state-to-state -state movement. What he's done, he's done it in accordance with the spirit of the Constitution, in that he's, le he's leaving it up to the governors of the several states. Now, the governor of Minnesota, while I was there, issued a ban for two weeks on groups of 10 or more gathering together, which specifically included churches. Now, that was the state of Minnesota. The state of Missouri, the governor has not instituted that ban at all. He has not said... Now, he's recommending that they don't, but he's not made an order saying if we catch anybody at church, we're going to have them arrested. And neither has the president said that. He's left it up to the governors of the several states, which to me shows that he has a regard and a respect for the Constitution of the United States. The states do have rights that the federal government cannot intervene on. So um, the person who wrote, states' governors have effectively impeded free interstate travel, I would disagree with that. A again, unless there's something I'm not aware of, I've not seen any blockades on any highways prohibiting Somebody from going from one state to another. I've not seen that anywhere. Um, they go on to write, the government's, uh, the government's local to me, counties and cities contiguous to me, have pushed stay-at-home and curfews, locked public restrooms in my closest city park. So even if you can go out, most stores except those deemed essential are closed. Uh, this is about crashing America, our personal freedom of choice, of movement, our economy, and getting everything online. A fast tech netting of our populace using these, this viral problem as a means for implement, implementation, capturing all our personal data and personal finances, and the perhaps initial launch is now just a practice run to implement the beast system you keep making vids about. Okay. To the person who said that, what, what would you say then when the president says, okay, this, the, we're on the downward slope of this thing. It's, it seems to be going away. I'm going to allow people to go about their day, go about their business as usual. Would you still have the same opinion? And don't get me wrong. 
I completely understand the distrust of government. I understand it. Let's go back in history for a little bit. Waco was a government operation that killed innocent men, women, and children. Some of them were not innocent, but they had a right to a trial, a jury trial. Um, I'm getting a message here. I'm going to read this. My parents are just traveling back from Florida, and some hotels are not allowing people with uh, New York state licenses to stay there. They were denied at some hotels in North Florida by Jacksonville and along the Georgia coast. Okay. I, I, I have no reason to doubt that. Uh, but again, that is not a government banning interstate travel. It is a, a private entity saying, you can't stay here. When I went to Minnesota, I made the choice to take my travel trailer up there and stay in it rather than stay in a hotel. Because I'm going, I don't know whose filth I'm going to be wallowing in, but I'd rather wallow in my own filth than somebody else's. So... Um, and let me get back to this issue of government. You have Waco. You have Oklahoma City. You have 9-11. Um, you have various events that have caused people to miss trust government and I completely understand that does that mean however that all those who are involved in government whether they be governors mayors county sheriffs state congressmen, national congressmen, and the President of the United States. Does that mean that all of them are bad? No, it doesn't. Does the fact that, let's say that you've got somebody who is president and um, they did some things years ago that you're going not ah, there's uh, uh, they're that they're not a good person. Does that mean that they're not qualified or they're not fit or they're not capable of running the country? Does it mean that God cannot use them? Now before you answer that, I'm going to give you scriptures on why I believe what I believe. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, some of the other comments. Mike, you asked, who are the saints that the Antichrist shall overcome? Uh, Revelation 11, uh, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them and kill them. Revelation 13, 7, it was given unto them to make war with the saints. Okay. Um, okay, anyway, um, here's another comment. If America had obeyed what you said about government and earthly authority, there would be no America. And from your own logic, black America should have taken up arms a long time ago. I'm not sure I, f I follow you. Um, because the police and states have certainly killed their women and children. And, and might I add that the American government has certainly been cruel authority over black America for 400 years. Um, 
you can't blame every person in government simply because some of those people of government believed in slavery or were racist. You can't blame all of American government for that because clearly there have been good people, congressmen, judges, presidents, governors, that were not racist, that helped free slaves, and here's the thing, Donald Trump was never, ever referred to as a racist until he became a presidential candidate. Now, all of a sudden, he's a racist. But the question is, what is it that he has done that has proven racism on his part? The fact that he calls this the China virus is an accurate statement, just like the Spanish flu. The Middle Eastern or the German measles or the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome disease, MERS. I mean, that's where it came from. Does that mean he's a racist? That's the way CNN keeps painting him. He's a racist. He's making racist statements. Um, no, I don't believe he is. Okay, I see what you're saying. Uh, the person who wrote me about the hotels saying it was mandated by the state governor. Okay. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. But I go back to my, my point. Was that you don't have a ban on people going from one state to another. I can go to Illinois. People from Illinois can get, I mean, all the interstates are open. To my knowledge, there are no highways closed off. There are no tanks in the streets. There are no National Guardsmen with machine guns shooting people who are going from state to state currently. So I, I, don't, I don't see that there has been a ban, per se, on interstate travel. Obviously, the movement of goods and products and services in this country requires that people be allowed to go from state to state in order to distribute those goods. So, anyway. Now... Let me go back to my notes and appreciate the comments and I appreciate civil disagreements with what I'm saying. I don't mind that at all. Um and when it comes to when it comes to earthly government We have to ask the question again, does God institute in this world government over the people of the world, including Christians, God's people? Should God's people, Bible-believing Christians, should they be obedient to earthly forms of government? Um, and I'll ask this question too. Does God um, ever use cruel authority or evil authority 
to fulfill his purpose? And the answer, I absolutely believe, is yes. I want to go to the book of Judges. Yeah, I got that. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. I have a, uh, there's a person, and I'll be honest with you, for the, for the last several years, I mean several years, this one guy listens to everything that I say so he can blast me. He poses under different identities. He will get Facebook accounts, multiple YouTube accounts. When he gets thrown off one, he just goes does another one. And it's his life's goal. I'm not even going to mention his name, but it's his life's goal to try to irritate me. He, sometimes he will pose as me. Sometimes he will pose as, as a son of mine. And he will make statements like, yeah, I follow Mike Hoggard. And, and um, you know, me and Mike Hoggard agree that uh, Donald Trump and, and Mike Hoggard and me, we hate all them N-I-G-G-E-R-S people. He'll say things like that to try to paint me as a racist. Yeah, anyway. Uh, what was I talking about? Government. I want you to look in Judges chapter 2. Um, God told Joshua, in the book of Joshua, he said, when you go in to the promised land, I want you to rid all of the people that are in Canaan. I want you to get rid of all the kings, Get rid of all the people. Um, I'll give you their houses for you know for you to take over. You can have whatever gold, whatever. But I want you to kill all those people. They were they were mingled people. They were giants, or of the race of giants. They were hybrids. And God said, "We're gonna we're gonna wipe them out." But Israel didn't do that. They left some of them there. Then you find out that that was actually part of God's overall plan. Again, his will to wipe them out. But his plan was, I'm going to leave them there. And then he explains why he's going to leave them there. In Judges chapter 2, um, let's go to... Look at verse 11. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. And the gods of the people that were round about them uh, and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord, verse 14, was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet... They would not hearken to their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them, and they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. And they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any more from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. 
that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he he them into the land, hand of Joshua. Now we go to chapter 3. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were there to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So what happens in Judges is that Israel goes through these cycles and they do it repeatedly. For a while... God give them a judge who would deliver them from their enemies and Israel would be at peace. The judge was, was not necessarily like a king. All a judge did was make rulings on how the law was to be applied to various people. The way Moses did. Moses was a judge of the people, not a king over them. And the judge had to follow God's law that God gave the Israelites. But when that judge died, generally the Israelites would go right back into their wickedness. They would turn against God. And then God would bring in... Uh, look at verse 8 of chapter 3. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. That's a big, long $20 name. The children of Israel served Chushan Rishathim eight years. Now, he was an evil king. But God put Israel under his authority. And he took away their power to stand against him. He flat took it away. So, was that higher power, Chushan Rishon Theim, of God or not? And again, I've heard people say, God's not in any evil authority. That's not true. It's blatantly not true. God's the one that put them there. Now, when they cried out to the Lord, he heard them. He would send them. Uh, who did he send after Chushan, Rish, and Tham? Um, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Chushan Rishathaim. The land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And then after he died, the Israelites turned back into wickedness again. So God brought in Eglon, the king of Moab, um, and was cruel authority over them. And Israel had no strength, no power, no might to stand against him. God take, took it away from them. But then they cried out to God. God sent them another judge who stood up for them, delivered them, saved them, ruled over them by the law, was a judge over them. Then when he died... Boom, they do it all over again. And I think it could be seen also in this country. We have had, we had eight years of Bill Clinton. We had eight years of George Bush, who I voted for. 
but I have since changed my mind severely on George Bush. He lied to the American people to get us in a war in Iraq. Now, I support our military. Those guys, most of them, are patriots. They love their country. I, I couldn't fight a war, I don't think. I don't think I have it in me to be a soldier. But the guys that signed up to go fight a war, I honor them. And will, as long as I have breath in this world, I'll go up to these men with their Navy hats or their Marine caps or their Vietnam veteran caps, shake their hand, tell them thank you for serving their country. God bless you for that. And I love hearing their stories, what they did, how they served, where they went. One guy says, well, I didn't do much. I was stationed uh, uh, out in um, San Diego or I was stationed, you know, at Fort Bragg or I was stationed here. Hey, you served. Somebody had to stay at home to protect the homeland. And then we had eight years of Obama. And I absolutely believe that eight years of Hillary Clinton after eight years of Obama would have pretty much nailed the last nail in the lid of the coffin of the United States of America. I have absolutely no doubt of that. Let me go back into a little bit, if you remember, some of the things that we endured. When I started the Watchman broadcast, Obama had just been inaugurated. So it, I had lots to talk about. Obama was a Marxist, socialist, and he had an agenda. There, have, there has always been people who have despised our form of government, the Constitution of the United States. They've despised it. Because it allows, when, when people have personal liberties... It means that they don't need, nor do they depend on, the government for everything. In fact, government, we understand you have a purpose, but limit yourself to your purpose and let me live my life. That's how a lot of especially rural Americans see it. Let us live our life. Let us raise our family the way that we believe that God is leading us to, or if you don't believe in a God or whatever, but let us live our life. Don't interfere. That's our Constitution. That's the rights that the states have that the federal government doesn't have any control over. So over the years, there has been control mechanisms put in place for the federal government to reach into areas that they really had no business in, like local school districts. The federal government should not ever tell a local school district what they can and cannot do as far as educating children. It's none of their business. But because of the Department of Education and the funding that's funneled through the Department of Education to local school districts, once those school districts start getting the money from the federal government in, 
the federal government then, Department of Education, whoever's, whoever's running it at the time, may say, okay, you've got this money coming in, but you have to, you have to do this, and you have to teach this, and you have to use these textbooks. You have to use Common Core, or we won't support you anymore. We will not send the $40 million that you would have gotten from us for the next fiscal year. You won't get that next year. Then you add on top of that the teachers' unions, which are extremely liberal. The teachers' unions demand that teachers get a certain salary. Where are they going to get it from? Local taxes? Never going to happen. So it makes them dependent on that federal money. And then whoever's the head of the Department of Education, they have the ultimate say in what those children learn. Not the local school district, which is why there's local school boards. Elected school boards. Schools should have the right to teach their children how they see fit without government inf interference. And over the last 50 years, that's what we've seen. More and more and more government interference. So I get it. I do. I understand why people are so distrustful of government. My question is, is it possible that not everybody in government is in on some giant conspiracy? Is it possible that we still have good guys? Well, let me tell you about Jefferson County, Missouri which is this county for the past eight years. I personally know the county executive. Now Jefferson County went from, they changed their form of government and they went to a county executive form of government where the county executive acts sort of as the president of the county. Then there is a, a board consisting of elected representatives from different parts of the county. But the county executive, I know him, known him since high school. He was my insurance agent for years. We played golf together a couple times. He counseled with me at times in the past. And he's a good guy. He's, he's the kind of guy that has made sure that no gambling casino comes into Jefferson County, Missouri, even though we're right on the Mississippi River. And according to the state laws now, because we're a river county, we can have gambling boats. Well, the reason why we don't have them is because he has said, no, absolutely not. We're not going to have gambling in Jefferson County. Now, he's one of the good guys. We had a sheriff, however, that one of the guys in our church sent him a letter asking him, you know, this was back when sheriffs were standing up against Obama saying, we're not going to enforce new federal guidelines on guns in our county. And if you send agents into our county to enforce federal gun laws, we'll have them arrested. So a guy in our church sent our county sheriff a letter asking him, Will you stand with the people and stand for the Second Amendment, or will you go along with Obama's gun laws? Well, he was a Democrat, so he, naturally he said, whatever the president says, that's what I'll enforce. That infuriated some of us. Now, does that mean that none of his deputies have a right to pull me over? That... They don't have any authority over us? Nope. 
doesn't mean that at all. They're still in power. They're still in authority. And it's up to us then to vote them out. And he was voted out. He's not sheriff anymore. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he stands on it. But he's not sheriff anymore. So to say the word government, and then to say everybody's in on it. If you're in government, you're in on it. You're going to take us into the new world order. That's like saying every pastor, because you had bad experiences at churches, that all pastors therefore are evil. And some say that which denies the scripture. God said that he would give good pastors to people who deserve them. So, again, your anarchy, the Bible doesn't support it. So now, here's the million-dollar question. What about the president of the United States that we have right now? Let me, let me go back and run through some of the things that we know has happened in the United States in the last, let's, let's go all the way back to Bill Clinton, when he was president. Now, in the 90s, there was a videotape that was passed all around the country called the Clinton Chronicles. And it basically started the whole idea of what's called the Clinton body count. And I've touched on this before. And Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton are two very evil people. Very evil people. Their corruption knows no bounds. And when Bill Clinton couldn't be... Uh, when Bill Clinton couldn't be president anymore... I believe a plan was set in place for his wife, Hillary, to be in president. But first she had to have some experience in politics. So she decided to run for senator of the state of New York. Well, it just so happens that a very popular person was thinking about running for Senate in the state of New York. His name was John F. Kennedy Jr. And isn't it unfortunate that he died in a plane crash? Very unfortunate. So now there's really no chance of him becoming a senator from the state of New York. Now Hillary's the candidate. Of course, she gets elected. And I don't know how long they've been doing this, but the Clintons have got what's called a foundation. A 501c3 charitable organization. Where people can donate large sums of money. And the Clintons then would use that to build houses for poor children in Haiti or to build medical clinics in Zimbabwe or, you know, to distribute food packs wherever hungry, starving children would be. But is that what they actually do with the Clinton Foundation money? Mm. Not a chance. It's a slush fund. And 
if you remember, Hillary was running against Barack Obama in the 2008 presidential primaries. Now, Obama's got his own set of things. Where did he come from? What country was he born in? We don't, we still don't know. And did you hear? You remember when they finally produced a birth certificate from the state of Hawaii showing that Barack Obama was born in Hawaii? Did you hear recently that there was a plane crash in Hawaii? Because that's allegedly where he was born, state of Hawaii. Did you hear that um, the woman, one of the women on, it was a small, small plane, had maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 passengers on it, went down and landed in the ocean just maybe about a half a mile from the shore. And somebody v recorded it on their phone. They all were wearing the little, you know, life vests. And when the plane landed, it didn't crash. It just landed in the water. Everybody get, got out of the plane safely, and they're floating in the water. One person died. Everybody else that said it was fine. They videotaped the whole thing. The person that died was the person who came up with the birth certificate of Barack Obama. She was the only person to have died in that plane crash, and nobody else died, and everybody else was fine. They're going, we don't know why she died, but she died. Anyway, so Hillary Clinton becomes Secretary of State. And during her time as Secretary of State, her and Barack, John Kerry, and others, John McCain, it's not limited to just Democrats, they sold our country out. They sold military secrets to China. They sold... Um, or gave billions and billions of dollars in foreign aid to countries who were never friendly with the United States of America. And some of that money got funneled back into the Kerry Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, the Barack Obama Foundation. You understand how it works then, don't you? It's called pay to play. United States sends millions of dollars over to a rogue nation that hates our country in order to appease them, making a loan to them that they'll never have to pay back. And then some of that money gets funneled back into the Clinton Foundation or other foundations. That's just, just corrupt as the day is long. And I don't know if you remember this, but when Barack Obama won the presidency in 2012, the second time, I shook my head and I said, apparently I don't live in the country that I thought I lived in. I thought there were still decent people in this country. And then Donald John Trump decided to run for office. Now, here's what I said when I heard that he was running for office. I said, you know, all my life, first time I ever voted was 1984. I was 18, and I voted for Ronald Reagan. And since that time, I have voted for who I thought would be the best conservative candidate to do what needed to be done in this country. And none of them has ever done it. It's like immediately when they get in office, they get compromised somehow, some way. And they pretty much do what they're told to do. I mean, why did Chief Justice John Roberts cast the deciding vote when they sued over Obama, the Obama health care thing, 
everybody in the whole country that's got a brain says this is illegal. They can't do that. And the Supreme Court justice said, yeah, it's legal. And I'm going, he's supposed to be a good guy. He's supposed to be a conservative. What, what, what's going on here? Have they got dirty pictures on him or what? And I would say more than likely they've got something on him. So when Trump was going to run for office, I said to myself, you know what? So far, every time we've elected a politician, they haven't done us anything. They've done nothing for our country. Nothing except for to help destroy it. Here's a guy that doesn't owe anybody any favors. He's not doing it for money. He's already got tons of it. He's not doing it for fame. Who doesn't know the name Donald Trump? Maybe, just maybe, he'll do the right thing. Now, there is the issue of Trump's... He's a billionaire playboy. Okay? That's what he's been. And there's no getting around that. So here's the question. In order for us to have a good president, I, I'll say it like this. I gave up a long time ago thinking that we would ever have a president who would be a fundamental King James-only Bible-believing Born again Christian. The closest that we ever came to anything like that was Mike Huckabee. And Mike Huckabee is Southern Baptist, I believe. And I'm not sure what Bible he reads. But he ran for president, didn't even come close. Nowhere near it. So, I guess the, the, the question that I, I want to, the fair question that I'm, I'm wanting to look into today is, can God use this man to do what's right for our country? And again, I've not given him a free pass as if he is the savior of America, because I don't believe that at all. The only thing that's going to save America is the word of God. But also remember that nobody, and I mean nobody, assumes control over the United States of America, but what God allows it to happen, including Bill Clinton, including Barack Obama, and including Donald Trump. Now, I'm going to, what I did was I did a, I did a study of the kings that are in the Old Testament. The kings of Primarily Judah. You're hard-pressed to find a king of the northern tribe, the northern ten tribes, that ever did anything good. And God always lets you know, when such and such became king, the Bible either says he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, or he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. One way or the other. But let's look at some of the leaders of God's people, the king. First of all, let's look at David. Here's what God said about David, 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. He's talking about Saul. Saul's con 
kingdom is not going to continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And he was referring to David, the man after God's own heart. So here is David. He is king. And um, he is a man after God's own heart. But was everything that he did right? No, absolutely not. Two huge sins that, da that David committed while he was king. One of them was 1 Chronicles 21. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. He wanted to number the armies. God didn't want him to do that. God said, David, let me fight the battles. Have I not done a good job for you already? David, I'll fight the battles for you. So Satan provoked David to count the number of men that were the could be armies of Israel. Uh, verse 2, David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Even his own counselor, Joab, said, David, you don't need to do this. Don't do it. But David said, go do it anyway. So here's, here's what happened in verse 7. God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. And David said unto, unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the, the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, either three years of famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtake thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for great, very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of men. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. For God to kill 70,000 people because of one sin that David committed is a grievous sin. But did God hate him? No. Did God cast him out from being king? No. Then we have the issue with Bathsheba. David, up on the roof of his house, I believe, obviously, I believe that David knew what he would see when he would go up there. I think David knew that he would see women bathing. And sure enough, he sees Bathsheba. He calls her, goes in under her. She conceives. David finds out that she's with child, calls for her husband, one of his mighty men, one of David's, it's in the list of David's mighty men. This is horrendous what David did. David took one of his heroes, one of his best fighting men, Uriah, go home to your wife. Uriah wouldn't do it. He said, I'm not going to go home and enjoy my wife while my guys are out fighting. So David said, okay. So he sent him back out and he told word to whoever was in charge saying, put him in the front, front line of the battle. And David had him murdered. So then David stole this man's wife. And um, 
2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, Nathan said to David, Thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine house, thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David was perhaps one of the greatest kings over God's people. But he had done terrible things. But God used him. Now I say David was one of the greatest kings. And I think an argument could be made that perhaps Solomon was even greater than David. In a different way, but greater still. And I want to ask you the question, who was Solomon? Well, we know he was David's son, but from who? You see, it happened exactly the way God said. When the child was born, the, ad the adulterous child that David and Bathsheba had, that child died as a young baby. <laughs> But then, what happened after that? Bathsheba conceived again. And she bore Solomon. Solomon. Without a doubt, one of the greatest kings of Israel. He was, at his time, Solomon was the most wealthiest man in the world. He was, without a doubt, the wisest man, aside from Jesus. He, he had so much reverence and respect that Solomon never had to fight a war, ever. Ever. The nations that had heard of the people of Israel and King David and King Solomon wouldn't dare touch him. We know that kings from all over the world brought King Solomon gifts to appease him, to let them know we are your friends. We're not, we're not going to invade you. We're not going to try to take over you. We know God is with you. Now, talk about billionaire playboy. That was Solomon. Solomon. Um... 1 Kings 11, King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of Moabites, Emonites, Edomites, Zidonians, Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord the, said unto the children of Israel, You should not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. We know that Solomon built pagan temples, that he offered incense to pagan gods. Solomon did all of these things. But was Solomon God's man? Absolutely. Um, here's what God said concerning Solomon to David. 2 Samuel 7, chapter 
chapter 7, verse 12. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. You see what God's saying about Solomon? Again, Solomon was a billionaire 700 wives, 300 women that were not even given the title of wife. They were just young ladies that he slept with, kept around. Built pagan temples, offered incense to other gods, and yet God called him holy. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we have most of the book of Proverbs that we know for sure was written by Solomon. We have the Song of Solomon and we have the book of Ecclesiastes, all written by Solomon. So did God favor Solomon even though his sins were great? Yes, Even Jesus commented about Solomon and how great his kingdom was and how greatly he was arrayed. God made a promise to David. David, if he sins, I'll chastise him. And God did. God raised up adversaries against Solomon. But God kept his promise to David And he said, I will always have mercy on him. Always. And God used him. Let me give you another example. And you can can look at this. You can do this yourself. You can get the King James Pure Bible Search software. Download it for free. And look for this phrase. Um... Did that which was, and then leave that blank. Or you can say, he did that which was. And the Bible then will give you a list of the kings. And some of them it will say, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And in some he will say, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And here's one of them, 2 Kings 14. Verse 1, in the second year of Joash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. And he was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Yet not like David his father. He did according to all things as Joash his father did. Howbeit the high places were not taken away. As yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. And it came to pass as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand that he slew his servants which had slain the king his father. So here is a king, Amaziah, whom God said he did that which was right in the sight of God. And yet there was still something that he did that was wrong. And I'm going to read some more. But if you ask me, do I support the current president of the United States? My answer has to be, on most things, yes. Let me me give you a little list of what this president has done that no other has had the nerve, the bravery, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
but he's done things that others promised they would do that they never did. Number one, he's confirmed two Supreme Court justices that are constitutional conservatives. And I need you to understand how important that is. Had Hillary remained, had Hillary gotten to be president, if you remember... Justice Antonin Scalia had died. And Obama was already a lame duck president. He wanted to replace Scalia. Was it Scalia or was it somebody else? But they... The Senate said they wouldn't let him do it. They wouldn't confirm it. No matter who he picked, they wasn't going to confirm it. They was going to wait for Trump to do it. Had Hillary won the election, they absolutely would have stacked the deck and made the Supreme Court so far to the left, it would have taken years and I mean years and years and years to get the court if we ever got it back to pointing in the right direction. We now have, for the first time ever, a chance to overturn Roe versus Wade in this country. Because Obama, or excuse me, Trump has made two Supreme Court justices since he's been president. That's a huge deal. We now have the court a predominantly conservative. So you remember uh, you remember Chuck Schumer, remember what he said? Standing in front of the Supreme Court, pointing his finger back and saying to Gorsuch and to Kavanaugh. If you don't vote the way we want, you won't know what hit you. He threatened the two Supreme Court justices that Trump put in there. Threatened them. The man should go to prison for that. That's a crime. If I did that, I would be arrested. Besides that, it's a crossing over of the balance of of the uh, division of the government that we have. The Senate does not have the right to tell the Supreme Court what they can and cannot do. It's called separation of powers. And who knows, at some point, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if Trump wins re-election... I don't look for her to last another four years. And he will stack the Supreme Court so that it remains conservative for the next who knows how many years. That's a big deal. We had Obama deliberately allowing illegals into this country unfettered, unabated, unstopped. The, the borders, they were just gushing with illegals coming into this country. And Trump said, I'm going to build a wall. And he started doing it. And they hated it. And let me tell you what that's about. It's about the liberals in this country, then giving these illegals not only your, your tax money in government handouts, but then giving them the ability to vote. I couldn't go to Kenya right now and vote for their president. 
I'm not a citizen. So why should I allow somebody who is not a citizen of this country to vote for who's president? But they're going to do that if they get the power back. And we were that close, people. We were that close. So, Supreme Court justices, the wall. Telling China, dismantling the North American Free Trade Agreement, which was a joke. If you lost your job back in the 90s, NAFTA is why. Dismantled NAFTA. Dismantled all these trade agreements that we had with other nations that favored them. And you know why they favored them? Because these same countries that were getting these great deals from the United States were funneling money into the pockets of the very politicians who were selling out our nation. And Trump put a stop to that. The CIA. President Trump has it's taken him three years and he's still got work to do. But the CIA is probably one of the most corrupt entities in the entire world. CIA. You remember, it's the CIA that was running... Uh, bringing in vast amounts of drugs into Mena, Arkansas, while well, Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. I got to hurry, but that was the CIA. Benghazi. Remember Benghazi? We were that close to that event never happening. We had guys who were on the way, Navy SEALs, who were on the way to rescue our ambassador and our embassy people. And they were called back. Who do you think they were called back by? Obama and Hillary. That's an act of war. Funneling millions of dollars into the Muslim Brotherhood so the Muslim Brotherhood can take over um, Egypt, Libya, other nations, Syria. You remember the, the pallets of cash that were shipped to Iran? Did you know that most of that cash never made it to Iran? It was funneled out to other nations and to their politicians and then eventually funneled back into certain foundations. So it's replaced top men at the CIA, top men at the FBI, which is also just as corrupt. He has replaced almost 200 federal judges. You ever wonder why these crooked politicians keep getting away with stuff and it never sees the light of day, never shows up in court anywhere? It's because these wicked liberal federal judges that the Clintons and the Obamas have put in made sure these cases never saw the light of day. And now that's, that can take place. And I'm again, I'm not giving him a free pass on everything he's done. Some things he's done is there's no way that I can condone that. But again, 
Let me read you another one. 2 Kings 15, 1. In the 20 and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. 16 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 2 and 50 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. And the people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the house, judging the people of the land. Here's another one. 2 Kings 15, 32, in the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed." 2 Chronicles 27.1, Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah did. Howbeit, he entered not into the temple of the Lord. Um... 2 Kings 18.1, now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the, king, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of uh, Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. However, however, um, let's see here. There's a passage of scripture here. Yes, yeah, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12. At the time of Barodak Baladan, the, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices, the precious ointment, all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. And there was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came the Isaiah the prophet unto the king Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left. So these kings, according to the scripture, they did right in the sight of the Lord, but there were exceptions. There were things that they did wrong. And I think the same applies to the current president of the United States. I voted for him. And so far, I am not sorry I did. He is a staunch supporter of the Second Amendment, of states' rights, which is why he has not instituted a national ban on move of, of he's that's why he's not issued a federal quarantine he's leaving it up to the states to do it as they see fit because that's what the constitution says he is limited in his power now you may agree you may not agree you may like him, you may not like him. I don't like some of the things he does or has done in his past. But I will tell you this. For the first time in American history, we finally have a president who points right to 
the press corps and says, you are lying through your teeth. Quit lying about me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Why are you asking me that kind of question? This is why your ratings are no good. This is why nobody trusts you. Normally, presidents are scared to death of the press. This one's not. And we know that the mainstream media, CNN, NBC, ABC, MSNBC, even Fox, some on Fox, lie through their teeth. And they hate this president. Now, ask yourself the question, why has, why has there been such an attempt to get him out of office? Why? Why is there why why did why was the whole Russian gate thing taking place? Why was it before he was even inaugurated? There was already talk of impeaching him, and he hadn't done anything. I'll take it up one more. Why was it when he won the nomination from the Republican Party, why did Barack Obama issue the commandment that a warrant from the FISA court be issued to spy on someone who was running for president of the United States because they bugged his office, Trump Towers. It's a known fact. He was, uh, Trump was not making that up. Certain people in the FBI and in Congress lied to the FISA court to get the FISA court to issue a warrant to have surveillance placed, have all his phones tapped, his office bugged, everything. This was even before the election. Why was it? that they did not want him to be elected at all cost. Why after a so-called whistleblower um, says that President Trump had a quid pro quo, a, a, a pay to play with the I guess the president or prime minister of the Ukraine saying that President Trump wanted favors from Ukraine or they were not going to get certain money that was promised to them. And then the president released the actual transcript of the phone call and the phone call itself. There was nothing ever said about that. Why then did they proceed with impeachment? articles against him. Why are, why are those in the liberal media and the liberal Congress, why are they trying so hard to get him thrown out of office? Ask that question. Why was a missile fired at Air Force One while President Trump was in it? Look that up. Look that up. Now, again... I don't like his stand on homosexual rights. 
But that's not an agenda that he's pushed. And I have some other, I don't call him a Christian because he's not. I'm not saying that he's the savior of, of America because he's not. And the shame of it is, is that we have elected people to represent us in this country who were supposed to be Christian that never did a thing for us. Why is this lost man, why is this lost man standing up more for our Christian rights and our Christian beliefs, even calling for a national day of prayer, which Obama never did? Why is it that it takes this lost man to show us Bible believers how to take a stand against evil in this country? Maybe that's the lesson that we should be learning from this rather than accusing him of being a New World Order shill and he's going to bring in global government. If anything, uh, research this. Those of you, and I'm with you, who have been opposed to the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, I don't, I don't understand how it all happened. But as of right now, guess who has the most control out of anybody in the world right now over the Federal Reserve? And it's not the Fed chairman anymore. It's the office of the president of the United States. Not just Donald Trump, but the office of the president of the United States. There was something he did in the last week or two that basically brings the Federal Reserve now back into the hands of where it belongs. With the people of the United States of America. Look into that. Now, I'm sorry this is not going to win me any popularity votes with anybody. Maybe some of you agree, maybe some of you don't. But we're told to pray for those who are in authority over us. And I strongly encourage you to pray for the man who's president of this country. Because it's possible. Remember when he told Hillary, you know, Hillary said, I'd hate to think of what the, this country would be like if you were in charge of the Justice Department. And Trump said it's because you'd be in jail. Remember, remember when he said that? What if he actually did have her arrested? What if he actually did? Is that even a possibility? Some think it is. And I may talk about that in future broadcasts. For now, whether you love or you hate me, you got to appreciate the Word of God. you got to see things how God sees them. Not everybody who's president is going to be a right-wing, fundamentalist, King James-only, Bible-believing, whatever. But I would hate to think where we would be right now if Hillary Clinton was president of the United States. That much I absolutely will not apologize for. Think five.